talking, but uh, we definitely wanted to keep have it just for those who, who wanted to come tonight uh, to worship the Lord and end our, our Sunday with Him. Um, a couple of things before we start. Number one, uh, I didn't get to say much this morning about it, but thanks to everybody who helped uh, Saturday with the work day. It was very successful, I thought, and we'll probably have another one coming up soon to finish up some things, but thanks for coming out and helping it means a lot to me, and I know Bob uh, did a great job organizing it, and uh, he would definitely uh, send his appreciation to you as well for coming out. All right, I think that's about it. Uh, we're going to have our normal Kids Quest tonight and uh, youth study. Uh, that is, if our youth teacher comes. Uh, I don't see him yet, so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll see if he comes. All right, well, let's uh, sing together promises. If you would stand up, uh, we're going to sing together promises. God of Abraham. We're going to be talking about Abraham later in the service. God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant. Let's sing together.
Please hear our call to worship tonight. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Would you pray with me? Oh, Lord, we thank you that you're the God who calls. Uh, Lord, the God who called uh, the world into existence in the very beginning, the God who said, let there be light, and there was light, and it was very good. And that ever since, as you send your word out to call, Lord, it actually changes things. It makes lives new. As it says here in Peter, Lord, we have been taken from the darkness and brought into marvelous light by your call. We praise you for that. Lord, as we come tonight, we want to learn more what it means to be your people. Lord, what it means to belong to you, body and soul. What it means to have our hope fixed only in you. What it means to have our sins forgiven. What it means to have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling in us. What it means to be sanctified. What it means to one day be glorified in your presence. Teach us these things tonight. Fill our hearts. And we pray, God, that you would forgive our sins. For we know that we have not proclaimed your excellencies, but have spent many times wasting our words, wasting our heart, wasting our time and our attitudes, Lord, instead of capitalizing and making the best use of every moment that we get with you. Would you forgive us, Lord? And tonight, O oh God, would you lift up our heads and our hearts Help us see Jesus and put our trust in him. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Peter chapter 1 says this, You were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. That uh, verse explains so well the the grace that God showed us through his son Jesus. It was the blood of Jesus that cleansed us, the blood of Jesus that purchased us from the feudal ways that we inherited to give us a new way of life. And so let's sing in response to that about God's amazing grace. This is a great hymn. It's number 460 in the red hymnal. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Let's sing together.
seated. It's good to sing that song, isn't it? Amazing Grace. If you have the hymnal in your hand, uh, turn back to page 846. You'll find on that page the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed. Last week we finished our first little journey there through the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Now we're going to look at a couple of the creeds. Uh, y'all are familiar with the Apostles' Creed. That was um, We use it every Communion Sunday, most of the time when we baptize people as well. The Nicene Creed is an expansion of that one. It uses the same structure, what we believe about the Father, what we believe about the Son, what we believe about the Holy Spirit. Uh, but in the year 325 and then in the year 451, uh, the church met together and expanded that Apostles' Creed to cover some more topics. And so you'll notice... It's a little bit more wordy, and it's got a lot more to teach us about our faith. Uh, Somebody might ask, why do we do creeds? Why do we do catechisms? Why do we do confessions? Uh, Because uh, from the very beginning of the church, uh, everybody, whether they were teaching true things or false things, everybody always appealed to the Bible to back up their belief. You know, even the people that taught bad things says, we believe the Bible too. Look at this. And so the creeds were written to say, no, here is what the Bible means when it says what it says. You can't just claim it and then take it and turn it to something that it doesn't even mean. Here is the solid summary of what the Bible says. So I'm going to ask you, you can answer with this glorious creed, Christian in an age of unbelief, what do you or we believe? We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, and who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And we believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, And we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. What a statement of our glorious faith, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Would you join me as we pray in response to that? Our gracious Father, uh, tonight it's our privilege to once again tell the old, old story of the gospel. How, Father, you created all things out of nothing and all very good. And you sent your Holy Son to be made a man for us and for our salvation. And Lord, you sent Father and Son, the Holy Spirit, into our lives to call us, to give us forgiveness and life in Jesus. Or we want to tell that gospel story again tonight and believe it and embrace it. Or we know that our relationship with you didn't begin the day we first believed. Or you had already met us before that day. You had already been working. You opened up our hearts to the sound of your word. You called us. You sent people to preach to us and pray for us, to share with us. You worked, Lord, through the Holy Spirit to gather many more into the church who went in before us so that they could invite us to join them in the family of grace. You sent Christ your Son to die. You established an everlasting covenant of grace with our forefathers. And Lord, all of this was rooted way back before there was time into eternity past when you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, set your love on us 
and exercised your sovereign choice to save your people. Lord, your grace is amazing. Your grace goes before us. It walks alongside us and it follows us. And we need every bit of it, Lord. And so we give thanks to you tonight. We worship your holy name. We ask that you would enable us to obey you willingly. Or give us willing hearts. Hearts that have been transformed by the love that you've shown. Teach us, Lord, that your ways are better than our ways. Fill us with love for the Father, even as the Son loved the Father. With love for the Son, even as the Father loved the Son. With love for the Spirit, even as Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to grow in eagerness to follow you wherever you lead us in life. The youngest person in this room with many, Lord willing, many years ahead of them. And the oldest person. And Lord, no matter how much longer we've got, Lord, help every day to be lived in willing obedience. Following you with all that we've got. Lord, not out of a heart of works righteousness, not seeking to earn our way into heaven, but because we have been given heaven. And because we've been given a taste, even here on earth, of the joy that we will experience in heaven. Help us, Lord, to release our ways of death, to embrace your ways of life. May our thoughts please you. May our words praise you. May our deeds put your goodness on display. We pray these things through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, let's look at our scripture reading tonight. It's uh, Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 9. You can find this in the bulletin, or if you have your Bible, you might want to turn there. We're going to be speaking about this in just a second. After the reading, our kids and students are dismissed. This is about Abraham. He's known as Abram at this point. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abraham passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Morah. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord, who had appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abraham journeyed on, still going towards the Negev. This is God's word. Kids and students, y'all are dismissed, and our um, Genesis lesson will begin in a second. Alrighty, so we are to the point in Genesis where we're going to start uh, looking at Abraham. Abraham uh, is, of course, you know, known as the father of, of our faith. Uh, the Bible makes a whole bunch about Abraham. Tonight we're going to see um, what I would call the headwaters of the covenant of grace in this story. The headwaters of of the covenant of grace. This is where God's covenant with his people, which was ultimately, you know, delivered in Jesus Christ. This is kind of where it was starting to, to begin. It was, it's like being up on the top of the mountain and seeing the, where the river starts and 
Even the biggest rivers have sometimes the smallest starts up in the mountains. Uh, and and this, is, this seems like a small start. It's just one man, uh, and God is calling him to do something pretty radical, but yet it doesn't seem very consequential. And yet, because this man does what God says, it becomes very consequential. And through this man, Jesus Christ comes uh, to, to, to establish the everlasting covenant that even you and I get to be a part of today by faith in his name. And so before we begin to talk about some of the details of the story, we've got to kind of remind ourselves, what is, a, what is the covenant of grace? What is the covenant of grace? Well, uh, you, you've heard me talk about covenants a lot, um, you know, especially if you come on Sunday nights. I've talked about it a lot in these various series that we've done. A covenant is a relationship that is based on promises. Uh, someone, usually a heavier person or a more substantial person in society, comes to a less substantial person and delivers certain promises in exchange for certain obligations that the lesser person will keep. And if they keep those obligations, the greater person promises that he'll deliver on what he said he would deliver on. That's sort of the basic idea of what a covenant is. People made covenants back in the day, way before this. Uh, people made covenants after this. People still make covenants. Uh, marriage, for what we talked about this morning, that's a great example of a covenant. Um, when, when you sign your mortgage papers, it actually has covenant language in there, if you read those. Uh, to have and to hold kind of language. That's, that's covenant language. But God takes something that was basically ordinary that people did all the time, and, he's, and he wants to use it as a way to describe how he wants to relate to us. He wants to relate to us in a special kind of relationship based on promises, obligations, and we'll see in the story of Abraham as it unfolds, in promises even to enable the, little, the lesser partner, us, to keep all the terms. Uh, because if it depended on us to keep the terms, it, it wouldn't last very long. But this, this story is just the headwaters, the very beginnings of a particular covenant that we call the covenant of grace. Uh, to understand that, I actually, if you'll take the hymnal again. Uh, this is kind of unusual, but I'll have you turn in the hymnal uh, to the very back again. And I want you to go to page... <clears throat> Um, 852, and you'll find way back there another, well, our confession of faith in, in our church. It's called the Westminster Confession of Faith. And there's a, a reason I'm having you turn there is there's a great little definition of the covenant of grace there. And you can find it in uh, chapter 7, paragraph 3. And I'll ask somebody to read it. Maybe Clint, would you read that to us? Paragraph 3. Yep. Very good. And then paragraph four. This covenant of grace is frequently set forth in Scripture by the name of the testament in reference to the death of Jesus Christ, the testator, and to the everlasting inheritance with all things belonging to it, therein be Very good. And so at the very beginning of what Clint read, it said, Man by his fall, having made himself incapable of life by that covenant. That covenant referred to the one with Adam, known as the covenant of life or the covenant of works. Uh, in the garden, if you uh, keep my word, I will bless you. If you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, I will curse you. You will die. And the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And Adam and Eve broke it. And because they broke it, this is saying they're no longer able to find life with God by way of works, by way of self-righteousness. And so what God did is he made a second and a greater covenant, covenant of grace, where not only does he make promises based on obligations, but as you can see there, he even promises to give the things that make the obligations possible for us to keep. Uh, the number one obligation that we have to enter the covenant of grace is what? Faith. And we know, I mean, you, that you don't just get faith by trying hard, do you? Don't you know that? 
Um, you can even think maybe of how you became a Christian. And I know there's a lot of different kinds of stories in this room about how you became a Christian, but all of us can testify to the fact that something was working before we started working. You know, we, did, we didn't decide to believe, and then boom, we believed. God was already at work, and that's what this is describing. In the covenant of grace, God promises to give his Holy Spirit to those who are ordained to eternal life to make them willing and able to believe. That, along with all the other blessings of the covenant, are given through Jesus Christ, it says. And so what we're going to say tonight about Abraham, this scene where God calls Abraham for the first time, is that even then God was dealing with Abraham on the basis of Jesus Christ. God called Abraham and gave to him the gift of faith in Jesus Christ, even though he didn't know him by name. He didn't know all the details about him. Yet he believed in the same essential thing that you and I believe, and he began to walk with God in response to that. And God took this man and got a whole lot done in the world through him and through his offspring. Uh, in fact, the Bible really, from that, this point on, only has one covenant by which people can be saved. The covenant made with Abraham. Uh, paragraph 5, if you'll look back down at that from the confession. This covenant of grace was differently administered in the time of the law and in the time of the gospel. Under the law or the Old Testament, it was administered by promises, prophecies, sacrifices, circumcision, the Passover lamb or the Paschal lamb, and other types and ordinances delivered to the people of the Jews. These are Abraham's people, all of which for signified Christ to come. But now, right? But now look at uh, paragraph 6. Under the gospel, when Christ the substance was exhibited, the ordinances in which the covenant is dispensed are the preaching of the word and the administration of the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper, which though much fewer in number than what you have in the Old Testament, yet uh, they're more simple, they have less outward glory, yet in them it is held forth in more fullness, evidence, and spiritual efficacy to all the nations. The same grace that Abraham had. Now I'm saying all this because you don't just read the story of Abraham and hear a nice story about an ancient dude who had an encounter with God. Uh, Abraham was the way, it was sort of like the D-Day Normandy. It, it was the, the beginning of the takeover of the world that God accomplished through Jesus Christ. And not only that, your relationship with God and Abraham's relationship with God, same. External details, different. We, we deal with God differently externally in the New Testament than they did in the Old. But nevertheless, same relationship, same God, same people, same way of coming to him. Amazing, isn't it? Because of that, we can learn so much. And so I, I want you to look at, if you look at your uh, bulletin, I want to talk you through three different aspects of this calling that God brings to Abraham here. Because everything in the covenant of grace starts with a calling. God said to Abraham, go. And Abraham went. The calling is what got it started. Very similar, again, to the way we relate to God. It begins with his calling. And our whole life is a response to his calling. Three things in the bulletin. Uh, what did God call Abraham from? What did God call Abraham to? And then what did God call Abraham for? And we're going to learn a lot, I think, as we look through those at our own relationship with God. First of all, what does God call Abraham from? Look at chapter 12, verse 1. And the Lord said to Abraham, go from what? Your country, your kindred, and your father's house. What's God asking Abraham to do? Leave it all behind. Leave, leave what behind? Security net. Everything he knows. His identity. All the things that back then they valued most. I mean, we value these three things today, certainly. I mean, it, we all do, but I think they valued them in the ancient world even more than we do. Country or land, kindred or relatives, and father's house, immediate family. I mean, if you want to talk about the top three maybe idols of the ancient world, land, kindred, and father's house. These were things people invested so much of their identity, so much of their security and self-worth in. And God says, leave all of it behind. 
All of it. Now think about why would God do that? Why would God want to rip Abraham away from the things he valued most? He was on the wrong course. Yep. Yep, he was on the wrong course. And unless he gets uncomfortable in himself, he'll never learn how to get comfortable in God. Which is always the case, right? If you're comfortable in yourself, secure in yourself, confident in yourself and what you can bring to the table, you're never going to learn how to be comfortable and confident in what God alone can bring to the table. Uh, let, let me give you uh, an example. Look, look over at um, Luke chapter 14. We'll get some words of Jesus in the mix here. Because I've already said that when God dealt with Abraham, he was already dealing with Abraham on the basis of Jesus. And you're like, I don't believe you. Well, here, listen to this. Listen to what Jesus says in chapter 14 of Luke, verses 26 and 27. Uh, Robert, will you read that to us? It's no problem. You can pass if you want. Yep. Happy Mother's Day, right? <laughs> yeah, that's a tough one. What does Jesus, what is he trying to say? Hate your mother, your father, your wife, your kids, your siblings? What does he mean? Love him more than them, right? Hate, like your love for me ought to make your love for them like it was hate. Because it so outweighs. So, so it's a question of value. And Mickey had said earlier that Abraham must have been on the wrong course. For God to want to rip him away from what he had before, it must have been something off. And I think it's exactly right. And, and honestly, even when we don't know something's off, something's off with us too. And, until God comes and calls us in such a way that it would disrupt our lives that it would pull us away from the natural path that we're on to the path that God wants us to be on. Uh, that's why Jesus says, you cannot be my disciple unless you do this radical un, you know, hitching from all those other things that you're naturally hitched to. Uh, you can't marry somebody unless you divorce the first person that you're married to, right? And for Jesus, you, know, you cannot marry Jesus unless you get a divorce with self, with idols, with self-righteousness, with whatever it is that's in your way. Now, we happen to know, if you go back to Genesis 12, we happen to know that for in Abraham's case, it was likely that he was on the wrong course for many reasons. Uh, Abraham, we know, grew up and was raised in Ur of the Chaldeans. We see that in chapter 11, verse 31. And Ur of the Chaldeans was the biggest city in this time. It was the biggest city in the world that we know about. Um, and there's been a lot of excavations in this part of the world. They've discovered that the city was devoted to the worship of the moon. Not only that, the names of Sarah, his wife, the name of his father, Terah, the name of his brother, Haran, all derive from words for the moon and the sun and other kinds of astronomical figures. Uh, leading many people to believe that Abraham, even though he lived, in, he, he grew up in the line of Shem, the good line from Noah, the one that had had the faith sort of passed on, nevertheless, it seems like their family line had been compromised by being steeped in a pagan culture. And so part, maybe, maybe part of the reason why God says to Abraham, to follow me, you've got to go out, you've got to leave, is because Abraham was surrounded by and had maybe bought into, partly, the various pagan practices that were going on around him. Interesting. Uh, in fact, we know this to be at least partially the case because in Acts chapter 8, yes, 8, the um, speech that Stephen makes in front of the Sanhedrin, 
He says, Abraham, your forefather, worshipped foreign gods in Ur of the Chaldees. And so, you know, the Bible itself says there was something wrong with Abraham. Now, I, I don't think that means necessarily that Abraham did not know the true God, like in any form. I think there was some way in which he already knew the name and he knew some of the stories that had passed down the line, line of Shem. But he had compromised it to where maybe he was mixing God, Yahweh, with the moon and the various other things that were popular in Ur of the Chaldeans. And so God says, you got to leave all that. you you got to make a clean break with your environment and with the customs that you're used to in order to come out and be with me. Same thing is true today. The worship of the moon is not very popular. Right? Or the sun or the stars so much anymore. But, as one writer points out, in a secular society where it seems to be non-religious... There is actually a constant, ever-present companion with that secularism. This is what he says. Secularism is always accompanied by sacralization. Let me explain. Sacralization is the development by which people, things, events, and processes are bestowed with sacred status, even as the tide of Christian influence ebbs from Western societies. What does he mean? That's a lot of words there. When people stop worshiping God, truly, because we're designed by God to be worshipers, we tend, instead of becoming secular like we think, we tend to just sacralize everything else. So that we may not have a God from a Bible or from a book as a culture anymore, but now we've turned our families, our nation, our material possessions, our sex, our ambition, we've turned everything into our gods. The writer's name is Eden Pravon, who says secularization is always accompanied by sacralization. The more secular a society gets, the more sacralized or made holy in their own minds every ordinary thing in life becomes. And I think that's a great example, a great description of the life that you and I are steeped in by nature. Listen to, listen to this. Ultimately, what we're talking about here is the idolatry of the self. Hmm? The idolatry of the self. Uh, we really tend to believe that we don't need a king except ourselves and that we don't need a goal except self-advancement. And so when God comes to us, and, and God, God comes to you when you first become a Christian and calls you, but you know, his calling is like a banner over your life after you become a Christian. His calling never leaves you. The Bible says God's calling is irrevocable. So every day of your life, God is calling, saying, get out. Leave behind the idol worship that's native to your own heart, that's so comfortable to the people around you, stop worshiping created things and come to me. Make a clean break. Hate your father, mother, children, wives. I mean, hate those things because you love me that much more than those things. You see, Jesus doesn't really, Jesus doesn't make it that much uh, of a guess. When God comes to you and calls you, it will upset your life. Anybody experience that? You cannot really have a relationship with God if it does not upset your life. If you haven't been upset, if your life has never been upset by God, maybe you haven't heard his call yet. Because his call always upsets the proverbial apple cart. Turns things upside down. Wow. And yet... In the example of Abram, what do we learn? To have my apple cart turned upside down is exactly what I need. Because not only is God calling Abraham from something, he's calling him to something. And the thing he's calling him to is worlds better than the thing he's calling him from. So let's look at that. What is he calling Abraham to? Uh, Look at verse 1 again. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the what? Land that I will show you. And when you get there, what does it say? I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great. 
Verse 3, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. What a promise. Abraham is supposed to go out of his you know, comfort zone, out, outside of the things that came natural to him, the various idols that maybe he had learned to worship, and he's to follow God to a land. But notice, Abraham has no clue where that land's at. Imagine the dialogue. Abraham, get out. Okay, where? I'll show you. And then God stops talking after that. And, and, and Abraham just has to start walking in order to discover it. Why would God do it that way? Why wouldn't God just give him a map, a survey of the land? Here is your travel brochure of where we're going to go. I'm going to take you here, 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 and here, and this is going to happen, that's going to happen. Why would God just say, Abraham, come, and I'll show you? Think about it. What's that? He'd miss out? Yeah. He'd try to rely on himself, probably. It's got to be a walk by faith, not by sight. We know that. He's transforming him. And so he's not merely giving Abraham a piece of land. He's promising Abraham himself. It's a little bit like this. Your boss doesn't come to you and say, hey, I got an assignment for you. What is it? You'll see. Your boss usually doesn't do that. Your boss usually comes at work because that's the way work is, and he, he's already got or she's already got it already outlined, A, B, C. Here's what I want you to do, A, and then B, and then C. Go do it. He, she or he gives you an assignment, and it's very clearly cut, and once you're done with the assignment, you're done with the assignment. When you check out of work, you're checked out of work. You're off the clock. And he or she is not your boss anymore till you get back on the clock. God is not giving Abraham that kind of relationship. If he had given Abraham the blow by blow, Abraham might think, okay, I see, this is like a, this is like a business transaction. Instead, what God does is much more the kind of thing that we do when we get married. When you stand in front of the altar to get married, as we talked about this morning, one doesn't say, hey, I want you to do A, B, and C. And the other says, okay, I'll do A, B, and C. You do D, E, and F. No, literally you say, I will be with you. No matter what. Sickness, health, rich, poor, death do us part. To have and to hold from now and forever. That's the kind of thing that God is promising to Abraham. For Ab See, it wasn't about the land, even at this point. It wasn't about a piece of real estate. Already, the relationship that God was going to have with his people through Jesus Christ was being offered to Abraham. And Abraham was about to walk right into that thing. In fact, I'll prove it to you. Uh, look down at verse 7. He goes into the land. Remember, God said, it's the land that I will show you. But when he gets there, what does God actually show Abraham? Verse 7. He doesn't just take him around and show him land. What does he show him? Yeah. It says, the Lord appeared to Abraham. You know, Abraham wasn't just on a tour <laughs> or, or on a, you know, a open house for a piece of property that he was going to one day get. Abraham was walking into a relationship, and every step of the way as Abraham goes in the land, God shows him himself. And Abraham worships, and then God shows him himself, and then Abraham worships, and God shows him himself, and then Abraham worships. Come with me, Abraham, and I will show you. Why that way? Because it's a marriage, not a business relationship. God is not trying to be Abraham's boss. And he's not trying to call Abraham as his employee. He's trying to call Abraham as his son. When you say he shows him himself. Yeah. Are you saying he shows himself? Self or God's self. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. No, no, that's great. Verse 7. The Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So 
It wasn't the land first that he showed him. It was himself. And then he showed him the land. The land was just an appendage, an appendix, on to the main thing that God was wanting to give Abraham, which was him. Wow. Beautiful. So when God calls you away from something, when he upsets your life and disrupts it and says, hate your mom and dad and come to me, uh, you're never going to be ripped off in the covenant of grace. Because God's not just going to give you blessings and goodies and you know, things like that. No, not things at all. Uh, God is actually going to give you something that you can get anywhere else. Nowhere else. Because he's given you him. I often think about this, you know, and, and maybe I'm thinking into it too much here, but I think about Abraham walking with God through the land of Canaan for the first time. He'd never been there before. This is going to one day be the land that Israel was going to come into, the land that Jesus was born in, the land that he would walk through. And Abraham's the first one to walk with God through that land. And I just think, okay, what, what places did he pass through that Jesus would one day pass through? And what were the places that God appeared to Abraham places of significance to what would happen with Israel later and with Jesus later? You know? Isn't there something of Jesus even in the fact that God is appearing in the land? Uh, in John chapter 1, verse 14, it says that the Word became flesh. And it says he tabernacled among us. Well, literally it means he pitched his tent in the land of Canaan. Verse 8 in our passage. From there, Abraham moved to the hill country on, on the east, east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east, and there he built an altar to the Lord. I mean, this is like a, he's getting a kind of gospel lesson here. This land is special, Abraham, not because it's some great piece of real estate. If you've ever been to Israel, you know it's not that great of a piece of real estate. To be quite honest, right? I mean, there's a lot better pieces of real estate in the world. I mean, why couldn't have God given him Switzerland? <laughs> or the Alps of France? I mean, those are way better places. It wasn't about that. This was going to be a holy place because God was going to show up and live there. God's son was going to live there. And Abraham is getting a little preview of that. A little taste of that. That's why, I'm, that's why I say, when God, this is the headwaters of a covenant of grace that God is going to fulfill in his son Jesus. And Abraham's just getting the little first spring waters, the snow melt, way up in the mountains that was, would one day become a huge river flowing into the sea in Jesus. And it was enough, actually, to change Abraham's life completely, to turn it upside down. And so look at the last thing tonight. What does God call Abraham for? This relationship that God has with Abraham, the covenant of grace, is transforming. Now let me ask you, and you can answer. <clears throat> As Abraham follows God and gets step by step this preview of God and of the land and all that, how do you see Abraham's life changing? What are some clues that Abraham's growing? Worship changing. Yep. His worship changes. How else? He became nomadic where he was in the city. Yeah, he became nomadic. What else? Who did he take with him? His wife. His wife. Yep. It's good. a good idea. <laughs> good job, Abram. But he took his, all their possessions, all the people, even his nephew, Lot. Right? So he took a bunch of people with him. Let me just say he took a bunch of people <laughs> Uh, the people that he had acquired, you know, th this is referring to the servants. 
the, basically the employees. And Abraham was a very wealthy man already at this point and had a lot of herds and flocks. He had a staff. He took the whole staff with him. And he took this guy named Lot, which we're going to hear a whole lot about. Give me a few things about Lot that you remember from other stories. Opportunistic. Is Lot going to be a liability to Abraham or an asset? Lot is going to be a massive liability. I mean, in many, many ways. One story after the other. Abraham's going to have to fight a battle to save Lot. Uh, Abraham is going to have to basically intercede for Lot to get him saved from the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. He's going to have to pray and beg God to save Lot's life, you know. Um, what's that? Lot chose poorly. Yeah, I mean the yeah the when the and he's gonna have to split from Lot because Lot's uh, staff because Lot gets rich too in the process. Lot's staff is gonna fight with Abraham's staff and they choose which way to go and Lot does choose poorly. Abraham chooses more wisely because, well, God tells him what to choose, so he kind of cheated there. But Abraham knew which way to go. Lot went down to some got Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham went up into the hills of Canaan. Every step of the way. Lot, in particular, is going to be a liability, and yet it wants, to, it wants you to know. It says it actually more than one time. Abraham took Lot. God said, leave. I don't know about you, but when, if God said to me, leave your country, your kindred, and your father's house, I would think, okay, I can leave behind everything. I can leave behind Lot. I could leave behind all this bunch of people, these, this staff. It's just me and God. But Abraham does not have the attitude of it's just me and God. When God blesses Abraham, Abraham wants other people to be in on it. Now, how did he come to understand it that way? That other people need to be let in on the blessing that he got from God. God had already told him. That's right. Verse 3. I will bless those who bless you. Verse 2. You will be a blessing. Verse 3. In you all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abraham's already starting to walk that out by bringing a whole bunch of people, including knucklehead Lot, with him. And Lot gets blessed by being with Abraham, doesn't he? I mean, he's a knucklehead, but he gets blessed time and again. And even in the New Testament, uh, Hebrews 11, it says Lot was righteous at the end of it. Which is, I read the story of Lot and I don't have a hard time. You have to squint really hard and turn backwards to see righteous Lot. But by faith, the Bible says Lot was righteous. Probably in large part because Abraham said, load up. Come on, you're coming with me. God's, God's taking me somewhere. I have no idea where, but we're going to get God. And I want you to get God too. Here's the lesson. The covenant of grace always, no matter what circumstances may happen in your life, it will always produce a worshiping heart and a serving heart. Always. In fact, these are the two things that when, when someone believes in Jesus, these are the two things that get fixed, or start to get fixed anyway. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That starts to happen. How does that happen? Grace. The grace of God begins to break into my, my stony, hard heart. And as grace comes in, worship goes out. Gratitude, praise, confession, thanksgiving, all the things that are involved in worship, humility, submission, begins to come out. Well, same thing here. As God's grace and generosity towards me comes in, service towards others goes out. Blessed to be a blessing. Blessed so that in you all the families of the earth might be blessed. Blessed. The headwaters of the covenant of grace are not very much different from the waters that we swim in. The cross of Jesus Christ brings into your heart such a depth of grace. You were treated not just better than you deserved. 
you were treated the opposite of what you deserved and are treated the opposite of what you deserve currently. And so like Abraham, every, I mean, notice every step of the way he's building an altar and calling on the name of the Lord. Every time God does something in his life, praise, builds an altar, calls on the name of the Lord. He worships God. And, and don't you know that as he does, he gathers this bunch of people. He gathers lot. We're going to worship. Come with me. We're worshiping God today. And it's true, I think, that the gracious heart, that is the heart that has received grace, just can't starve itself of worship without really grave consequences. You know? If you don't want to worship, you don't understand grace. That's what it's saying, right? And in the same way, the heart that's captured by grace wants to share it. If you don't want to share it with other people, right? If you want to keep it to yourself. <laughs> if you don't want to invite anybody and take anybody along with you. You don't know grace. At least, at least not the way the Bible defines it. The amazing grace that we sang about earlier, the grace of Jesus. In fact, Jesus is a great example of this. What came out of his life more than any two other things? Worship. Right? It tells us that Jesus, it was his custom to go to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and worship God. That was his custom. If you want to know who Jesus was, that was it. Every Sunday, every, every Sabbath day, he was in church. And every day he found some time to be with his father to worship him. And also, of course, we all know this about Jesus he served people without fail. I mean, he served people with no, nothing held back. He was willing to, to really die to himself, truly die to himself in order to, to bring a bunch of people along with him into the blessing of God. And so, y'all, I just want to encourage you tonight, just thinking about this, this headwaters. We're going to spend numerous weeks here just thinking about Abraham and there's lots of other great details about Abraham's life that we're going to get to. But for now, this very familiar story should remind us of the basic rhythm of what a relationship with God looks like in Jesus. Grace comes in. Worship goes up. Service goes out. We leave behind our former way. We cling to God. That's what it means to be a Christian. Let's pray together. God, we thank you tonight for your mercy. We thank you for this uh, beautiful Sunday and the opportunity to read the scriptures and think about the scriptures. Uh, all those years ago when you called Abraham, Lord, we, uh, we, we are made of the same stuff as him. And tonight, what a joy it is to remember that day and to think about how you have also called us and we must leave and we must cleave and we must serve and we want to and must worship. And so God, tune our hearts, make us better worshipers, better servers, and bring us more into tune with your grace. We pray it in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen, amen. All right, welcome back kids. Uh, let's uh, stand together. We're going to end by singing. This is uh, hymn number 48. We've done this one before. I think it was on Sunday morning before. Um, it's a piece of Psalm 9, and uh, I wanted to do this tonight because Psalm 9, I mean, I imagine this, uh, you know, these words or words like this were words that might have been flowing out of Abram's heart as he first heard God say, come with me, because it says there, O Lord most high, with all my heart, your wondrous works I will proclaim. Let's sing together, Lord most high. Most high with all my heart, your wondrous works I will proclaim. I will be glad and give you praise.
praise and sing the praises of your name. The Lord, the everlasting King, is seated on His judgment throne. The righteous judge of all the earth will make His perfect justice known. Jehovah will a refuge prove, a refuge strong for all oppressed, a safe retreat where weary souls in troubled times may surely Thanks for being with us tonight. Again, happy Mother's Day to everybody, and hope you all have a good uh, evening. We'll see you soon. Don't forget, two weeks from now, we will not have the evening service here, up at the high school on the 22nd for our particularization service. But next week, we will be here, okay? Uh, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in his hope tonight.